Hi, my name is Gary Patterson, and once again, welcome back to this Lenten series, Longing for Home, to a conversation about the Gospel reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent, and to the conversations you might have about the Book of Reflections on Facebook, in your congregation, over a meal. Once again, we're in the Gospel of John with a reading that includes what is perhaps one of the best-known verses of Scripture, John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And that's where I want to start, wondering what John means by eternal life. Eugene Peterson, in his version of the Bible, The Message, translates this as whole and lasting life. I like that since it suggests both the quantity and the quality of life that God is offering. Too often eternal life is only seen as something that comes after this life in heaven. And yes, hope and assurance in the face of death are clearly part of what John has experienced in and through Christ, but I wonder what eternal life looks like in the present moment, the quality of life, not just its quantity. Those moments when we're unaware of the passing of time, lost in the depth of the moment, when we feel completely at home, discovering what it means to be fully alive, real, completely present to and in God's love. Is that eternal life? I wonder if this is what the mystics hint at and occasionally tried to describe, but that almost sounds esoteric, as if it weren't something possible for the ordinary person who believes in Christ. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is the prayer from the letter to the Ephesians, which expresses the hope that Christ might dwell in our hearts as we are being rooted and grounded in love, as we come to know the breadth, length, width, and depth of the love of Christ, and we are filled with the fullness of God. That sure feels like eternal life to me, and I yearn to talk to other people about such experiences. Have you ever had such a moment? How would you describe eternal life? I don't think that we create such moments. We need to be open, yes, but they come as a gift from God, as grace. For God so loved the world, and it's God who gave. I hear echoes of where we began this journey with Jesus' baptism, where God declares, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I think that when we experience God's love, well, we experience eternal life, and we discover what it means to be home. God's love for us, for the world, for all creation. That's what transforms the earth into a real home, and not just for us, but for all our relations. Good news for us becomes good news for the world. John spends time in this reading talking about light and dark, living in the light, hiding in the dark. I always worry, though, about dividing things so clearly. I'm not easily a black and white believer. I think there's lots of room for gray. I remember Martin Marty, the former editor of the magazine The Christian Century, saying that he lived in a world of 5149. It's an ongoing challenge how to make clear decisions and yet recognize that there is always nuance and complexity. I'm also troubled by the association of darkness with evil. Friends whose skin color is darker than mine have helped me understand how problematic this is and how important it is that we talk about the unintended impact of our metaphors. But what I do appreciate is John's clear naming of evil and Jesus' confrontation of that reality. I can be so caught up in liberal nuance, being a good United Church kind of guy, that I'm reluctant to acknowledge that sin abounds. And yet I know full darn well that we humans are driven by devious forces and on so many occasions, we have unleashed evil and done terrible things. The theologian Reinhold Niebuhr said that sin was the only doctrine that didn't need much proof. You simply had to open any history book or read any newspaper. So part of our Lenten journey is to let a holy God light shine on our lives and on all that's happening in the world. I recall a line from a poem by Leonard Cohen that speaks to this. Blessed are you, O God, whose presence illuminates outrageous evil. And isn't that what John is talking about? The threat and the gift of being exposed, of having our very worst actions illuminated, but trusting that God doesn't come simply to condemn, but rather to transform, 
to bring life. I can't help but think about the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, shining light onto what happened to Aboriginal people in the horror of the residential schools, bringing both judgment and love. For surely the longing behind the work of the TRC is that the future will be changed when the Church and our country understand what truly happened in the residential schools, when we repent, apologize, and seek a reconciliation that is rooted in changed actions based in respect, equity, partnership, well, just maybe we'll have a glimpse of what eternal life might look like.